Den absolut tuffaste person som jag någonsin träffat det är Storbritanniens före detta premiärminister Margaret Thatcher. Alla var rädda för henne. Hon kallades ju för järnladyn och jag förstod direkt varför när vi träffades. Eh, till och med hennes egen assistent tassade på tå och innan vi kom igång med intervjun så styrde och ställde och donderade hon både med honom och med kameramännen. Och jag kan ärligt säga att jag har aldrig svettats så mycket under, no under en intervju som jag gjorde under intervjun med Margaret Thatcher. Och jag tror att alla som ser intervjun kommer att förstå varför. Särskilt när jag ber henne att hoppa. Margaret Thatcher var Storbritanniens premiärminister i 11 år och världens mäktigaste kvinna på 80-talet. Jag har fått en halvtimmes intervju med henne apropå att hon har kommit ut med andra delen av sina memoarer. Och det är alltså här hon håller hus på 35 Chesham Place i London när hon inte är ute på någon av sina lukrativa föreläsningsturnéer. I think you'll perhaps move those two pictures a little bit closer, Mark. It's not that one, no, it's the other one. That needs, yes. No, no, no further than that one. The other one a little bit. That's right. No, no, you've gone too, too close. Move this, uh, this one further. Yes, that's right. Lady Thatcher, the Swedish people know you very well as the former Prime Minister of Great Britain. Who they don't know is the little girl Margaret Roberts who grew up in Grantham and they don't know the reflecting woman behind the face of power. Now, you have described her in your book, Path to Power. When I speak to men, they very rarely like to admit that they have power, and even less that they enjoy it. What about you? But to be prime minister is to exercise power. You must be conscious of that responsibility, conscious that there are people who don't necessarily agree with what you want to do. And therefore, the way in which you exercise power must come from strongly held principles, translated into practical policy, and then acted upon. Mm. Principles are no use unless you make them as policy and then act upon them. And I think it is that, and then communicating what you're trying to do, all of that makes up the power which, in fact, you exercise. So don't try to say it's not what it is. Mm. But did you actually enjoy having power? I had, from a child, a fascination with history and politics. That was not the only fascination. I was also fascinated and quite good at music, quite good at um, elocution, reciting poetry, and also, of course, because they were interesting times fascinated by science, and I took my degree in science. So it was not only politics. If you go into politics, you must bring something else to it. I bought science, mm -hmm. love of arts, so and when history. You, sorry, when you grew up in Grantham, on top of the grocery store that your parents owned, you had an elder sister. You were very strong, believing Methodists. Can you tell me what kind of life did you lead? We lived a very wholesome life in a small town where, uh, if your father's a grocer, he's well known. My father's also a local councillor, chairman of our finance committee, and eventually mayor, so he was well known for that. He was also on the governing board of two of our schools and a very strong Methodist and a local preacher. Now, can you imagine, we believed certain things, had strong Christian backing, and we were well known and took an active part locally. It's so different from life in a very big city 
and I think it's just the perfect background. Mm -hmm. I, um, we lived above the shop, so there were always people coming and going. And I got used to people. In our shop, we usually stayed open late on Friday and Saturday nights, not only for people to come and buy their groceries, but they'd stop and talk about the politics of our time. This was the mid-30s, and then the beginning of war, then Dunkirk, what was going to happen? I knew all of this, and the thing that I remember most of all, however great the difficulties were in Britain, however great when we had to stand alone and after Dunkirk, we never doubted but that we would win through because we were in the right. And you knew, you knew all the time that you were right, you were true blue conservative. Do you remember what kind of dreams did you have as a little girl? I think the dreams that everyone has, the dreams of a peaceful world. For personal, I mean, personal dreams. Personally, uh, my great ambition was to go to university. Uh, one of my cousins had gone to university, uh, he on economics, and I wanted to go to university on science, and that came about. To go to Oxford, Oxford University was a fantastic mm -hmm. privilege for me. But there wasn't deep, deep inside of you a little voice saying that someday I'm going to rule Britannia? Oh no. In the days of my youth it would not have been possible. Members of Parliament were not paid very much. And therefore I could not just have contemplated that sort of career, nor indeed was I a socialist where the unions would have backed you. And it wasn't until in the post-war period when uh, members of Parliament were paid a reasonable salary and it became possible and all of a sudden new vistas opened up. Your dream became true, you went to Oxford, you studied chemistry successfully, you became very much more involved in politics and after a while you also met your future husband, Mr. Dennis Thatcher. When he proposed to you, do you remember how you reacted? Well, I don't believe in discussing these things uh, in that kind of detail. I met him in the constituency for which I was the conservative candidate. He was active. He had fought in the war. He'd gone back to the family business, which was chemicals and paints. So we had a lot in common. We were passionately interested in politics and economics. I was a scientist. He was in the scientific business. And so we had came together as friends. He loved music and I loved music and he was helpful locally. And so it grew. And I think in a way that perhaps is better than, than a sudden thing. Certainly it suited us and I thought very carefully and, and so did he because I was um, interested in politics. But of course uh, it was an ideal match. Then you applied for jobs and you weren't successful immediately. I know that one of the managers that you applied for a job wrote a note saying, this young woman has too strong a personality to fit in. Yes, I do. I, I saw that <laughs> when I was being interviewed by him. I just read upside down what it mean, and, and also the way the conversation went. Yes, I did have a strong personality. I suppose I always have it. If you believe in things, then you tend to put them forcefully. And I think he probably thought that having strong beliefs in politics, my mind might be taken off the scientific research that I should be doing. I think he was probably right. What are you most proud of, of the things you achieved? We were the first country to attempt and to succeed in rolling back the frontiers of socialism, which is the first cousin to communism. No one else tried it. We were the first to do it. I remember some politicians saying, we're watching you very carefully, Mrs. Thatcher, to see if you succeed. We did. But I had the toughest time. I'd learned something from my father. It's not how you begin a job. It's whether you stick to it and see it through. It's the perseverance that counts. Well, well, I knew I had to persevere, and I did. For the first two and a half years, I had a terrible time. Then I applied to overseas affairs, to the first aggression against Britain in the Falklands, the same rules that I had applied in economic responsibility, personal responsibility. We were not going to stand aggression. Mm -hmm. And we what? were the first country to say no. But you also had to go through very, very rough times, uh, both as a prime minister and even before that. 
I mean, in the press you were called Thatcher, the Snatcher. You were voted the most unpopular woman in Britain. That's right. They, they were all the time criticizing you in a very, very personal way. How did you take that? Um, I took it hard, but it was very unfair and it was a calculated attack. What did I do? Uh, I, was I was Secretary of State for Education. My job there was to see the children got a good education, vital. Unless you make, take advantage of that opportunity, you're not doing your best for the child. Nevertheless, every child had free milk in the morning. Free milk, uh, a third of a pint. And then there were heavily subsidized school meals. And I thought, if I've got to cut expenditure, and you do have to cut expenditure, if taxation does not get too great, and you know about that. You do have to cut expenditure. I'm not going to cut the education. And yet I want to spend more on building better schools. And so what did I do? I said, well, my parents could afford to pay for me in very much worse times to have a little milk every morning. And these much more profitable and successful times, they can afford to pay for their own children to have milk. So indeed, I wasn't snatching milk. I was saying to people, you can afford to pay for your child, have a third of a pint of milk in the morning. This, of course, milk snatcher, all the socialists came up. Socialists mm -hmm. don't like people to do things for themselves. Mm -hmm. Socialists like to get people dependent on the state. You never build a great society that way. But you have said yourself that you think that women are more vulnerable to personal criticism than men. Uh, well, many women are. I wasn't. You weren't. I had a mission in life. Mm -hmm. I had yes. a job to do. <gasps> and believe you me, when a woman has a job to do, she's tough and she sticks to it. You have been the most powerful woman in the world in the 80s. Do you think that you've been a very important role model for feminists and women? I don't know, Mrs. Gandhi, I knew. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. The women who got on in politics to the top often went to Somerville College, Oxford, or to Oxford University. Mrs. Gandhi did, uh, I myself did, Benazir Bhutto did. It's very, it's just mm -hmm. something to note. Mm -hmm. um, did I think I was a role model? No. Frankly, the phrase role model hadn't been invented then. So you said that if you want something done, no, if you want something said, you should ask a man. If you, you want, want something done, you ask a woman. That's quite right. We women, I think, spend less time talking and more time doing. Would you say that in your uh, life as a, a political leader that you have been able to use your femininity to get what you want? No, I don't think so. It never occurred to me that way. I use my arguments and maybe a certain passion because if you feel things strongly, then they do come out strongly. But it never occurred to me to, uh, to, to, to attempt to, do, to use feminine wiles at all. But do you like being a woman? I mean, do you like dressing up? I enjoy up? being a woman. I've never tried the alternative, and I don't want to. The former president Mitterrand, he said uh, that you have the lips of Marilyn Monroe and the eyes of Caligula, which was a Roman uh, fighter. And the will of an English woman. When you had to resign, that must have been your most difficult personal crisis in your life. Is that right? Um, it, it, um, it was and it wasn't. We were only two votes short of the requisite, uh, I think, 15% majority over the other. But there was two fundamental votes. And I couldn't carry on with anything less than full support. So, right, I went. But how did you deal with this personal crisis that you must have been through? Uh, well, frankly, uh, there was so much to do, if I might put it that way. The personal crisis came towards the end of November. I had already made all my plans for Christmas. We had a big Christmas at the Prime Minister's house at Chequers. Everything, all the invitations were out. As usual, all the parties had been done. Um, we had, of course, all the political changes. We had big debates, had a big censure motion coming up within the two or three days, which I took. So within five days, I had to cancel all the plans we made in the future do the censure debate, which turned out to be a triumph, uh, and move out of number 10 
and into my small home. All of that had to be done. And I, well, we just moved everything out, and then I, it took me a long time to sort it out. And a completely different Christmas. Uh, reality well, is a very powerful medium, you know. This was reality. I chose to go. But being this, I mean, this passionate political uh, human being that you are, I mean, you can't be all the time. This first Christmas that you experienced after you had to design, how, how was that Christmas? Oh, it was uh, what I simply had to do was uh, take away all the invitations. And we had Christmas Day. Uh, we booked a, a, a very lovely suite in one of the hotels and had it with all our friends there. So we got the, the Christmas Day friends came, but it was in a hotel, and it was quite a shock. But they were. That's life. Mm -hmm. How do you I had them there for 11 and a half years, and so then it came someone else's chance. You just mm -hmm. accept what you have to accept and get on with life. I've been all over the world since. So when people criticize you and you say, what it led to the period when you were prime minister was that the rich became richer and the poor became poorer. That is not correct. The poor also became less poor because the benefits at the bottom for those who are genuinely poor do go up. The money spent on education goes up and on the health service goes up. So that is not true. Mm. What happens, you might get a bigger gap, but you might start here, quite a, a small gap, particularly if you're paying top tax at 83% on earned income and 98% on savings. You, you gap, your gap goes up, it does go up, but the whole thing moves up. The gap may go up. You must give people incentive. I don't understand why in Sweden you have so little confidence in the individual, so little confidence in his earning capacity that you say, we must take the lion's share of what he earns to be spent by the state. And when 68 percent you got up to. Oh, well, now it's down to 50. Ah, so uh, it should be. <laughs> it should never have got up to 68. <laughs> Do you know the two richest countries in the world? America and Japan, 30 mm -hmm. percent. Mm. We are down. I, I was. Mm. Um, I got ours down to thirty-eight percent. But listen, I can tell you 41. something. When you walk the streets in Sweden, you never stumble over poor people lying in the streets. And here in London, you know, you see beggars everywhere. Yes, and yet they have they have better facilities. And we should really sometimes, I say, just clear the streets and get people into the hostels which are there for them. Uh, you know that our uh, right-wing leader, Carl Bildt, is now a negotiator in the hopeful yes. peace mm -hmm. process going yes, on? Yes, I'm afraid he's only been in there recently. Uh, don't forget this terrible thing started. It was in 1991 yeah. that I was saying what should be done. Yeah. Would you like to be a negotiator yourself? No, I would not. I would not like to be a negotiator. I hold far too firm views for that. Not that Carl Bildt hold, holds also firm views, but my views are clear. Do you appreciate Every him? Every nation has the right to defend themselves. The right of self-defense is far older than the United Nations, and the United Nations has no right to take that right away. Fair. And, therefore, it is wrong to deprive the Bosnians of the weapons, which they did for a long time, and still are doing officially, mm -hmm. to deprive them of the weapons to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you'd done that, as I said right at the beginning, you should have had then an ultimatum to the Serbs, who are the aggressors, you get out, you're given an ultimatum, stop this aggression, you have five or six days to do it, or in fact, we will then put every single uh, air attack that we possibly can on every Serb target and targets on Serbs. Well, that was back in 1992. I know, but women are supposed to be more peaceful than men. You don't seem to be. What good is the peace of Nazism or communism? You answer me. Do you think that's peace? Do you have no rights? Do you I, have no I, law? I, you know what I was thinking what about? What good that? is the peace of I Nazis was thinking and about, communism? I was thinking about the Falkland Island, and I couldn't quite uh, you know, think about communism. Well, you're saying peace at any price. I went down to Falkland Island that they may have peace mm. with liberty. Mm. Precisely my point, that they may have peace with liberty. What but was the peace of Stalin? Do you know how many people Stalin murdered? Don't you think that people in the Soviet Russia, since Mr. Gorbachev gave them that fundamental human rights, freedom of worship, freedom of speech, 
I know I agree with you in this, but the question is, do you believe that women are more peaceful than men? As a there have been many women who fought loyally that peace with freedom and justice should prevail. That is worth fighting for. Would you see your children go under a totalitarian regime? Would you like them to have been brought up under Stalin or Brezhnev without being allowed to read a Bible? And being an offense to have it? Without any rule of law, there's still no rule of law, only the diktat of the ex-communist party. Is that what you call mm. peace? It's not what I call peace. It's what <laughs> I call force. You are very good at, at getting me away from my questions. No, you know? I am good at making you formulate your question yeah. properly. Yeah. Peace is not peace under Stalin, mm -hmm. Hitler, dictatorship, communism. But I, it was I, merely the, I, it was the presence of a war of dictatorship over the people. We asked a taxi driver on the way here about you, and he said, well, I only have one question, and that is, why doesn't she come back into politics? Isn't that nice of him? Because I don't think you can come back. Uh, I, I think it's uh, the chance of the young people. As I was given my chance in my time, and I can tell you that there are people around me who are every bit as passionate about what I believe in. As passionate as, as you? Was. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I doubt it. Oh, yes, they are. When, when I read uh, your book, I, I always get the impression that you think that Great Britain has been standing for something more than other countries. Oh, yes, we have. What? Well, a thousand years we've not been occupied. We've stood up for liberty and justice, and we've had it. Why do you we, think the British the pa do Parliament that? sovereignty started in the 13th century here. By a few group of pe people, there were barons who said to the king, we are not going to supply you with the money necessary to carry on the kingdom unless you look at some of our grievances. Now that was personality, the personality of the English in those days. And gradually it went more and more. So we started the parliamentary sovereignty, the sovereignty of the people. I know, but why? We had one of the most oldest laws because we had the most great judges. We have something called equity and fairness. You would understand that in Sweden. When I'm lecturing in, in a, a university in Moscow or in St. Petersburg, I say equity, fairness. They say, what's that? You see, they never had any concept of fairness. I said, well, you will understand, because everyone does, decency and honor between people. But are the British better than other people? Well, we haven't been defeated. So you are better. We've stood up for what we believed in. But what I hate more than anything else in the world is what Hitler stands for. And but you did, did you fight against him? Well, I wasn't born. <laughs> did your I people like fight to. against him? I would, I would like to. I would like to have said that my people have so against him. So you admit that as a matter of fact, it was. America, Canada, and Britain that land on the Normandy beaches. Yes. France I had been defeated. But, listen, but I didn't uh, get the question. Spain was under fascism. Italy had been under fascism. So you admit all of those things. Yes. And then I you say, well, you don't like it if we say we are better. I say we were better at standing up against tyranny. And that is fact. And okay. that is the lesson of history. Yes, but that wasn't the question from the beginning. I was just going to say that. To me, what Hitler stood for is the, the worst that, uh, I mean, is the worst in history. But to me, it is uh, a person or a people saying that our people is better than any other people. But what are you saying by better? What I am saying is, as a matter of fact, it was the Anglo-American alliance that stood up and fought the tyranny which you hate. So did Norway. So did Denmark. So it's the Scandinavians as well so who stood up and fought. What do you think of Sweden? Sweden was neutral. What do you think of Sweden? I think if people had been neutral against Hitler, Hitler would have won. If people had been neutral against Stalin, Stalin would have won. So you think that Sweden was No, I am not going to go coward. and say any more. Mm -hmm. Are you very different as a private person? No, not at all. Um, I do quite a bit of things around the house. My mother was a very good needlewoman and also very good in the shop, so I am good uh, with those things. I cook. I enjoy cooking. I only have help in the house five mornings a week. 
But I and mean, so are, you as, are you as passionate and as dominant as you are in this situation? I like things done methodically. The way you want them to be done? Well, I like it done methodically. Housekeeping is very much better. Mm -hmm. If you do things methodically, if you have a budget, mm -hmm. if you know how to uh, spread the budget, you do quite a lot of things yourself and we keep friends. Of course we have friends and you like entertaining them and entertaining you. We love music and uh, I wish I saw more of our grandchildren. And we have a passion for the future. This is what it was all about. That the lessons of the past should be learned and that its mistakes never repeated. Uh, before this interview I was told that you did not want to answer questions about the French nuclear uh, program. I don't think it's um I, I will answer your question uh, if you wish. Well, I, I wonder why you didn't want to answer the question. Well, I didn't think it relevant to my years in power, but um Okay, so that's why. But would you like to answer it? I will mm -hmm. answer your question if you wish. Okay, so I just want to know what you think about uh, what the French just recently did. We all of us rely on the nuclear deterrent. A deterrent to stop anyone who might get hold of nuclear weapons and want to use them. And so we say if you do that, we can come in much more strongly. You cannot say that unless you know that your nuclear weapon would continue to be effective. It would be no good someone getting out of nuclear material is saying, Will our nuclear weapon work if you don't know? And that must be the thinking behind President Jurak. He wants to know that his nuclear deterrent will be effective. We in America are using different methods, but someone is testing to see whether it is effective. And I think for the strength of the deterrent, he was right. So I just have one last request. Uh, all the people that I interview, I ask them to do something for me. It's kind of a gimmick on my show, uh, and it's to make a jump, just to stand up and make a jump up in the air. I shouldn't dream of doing that. Why should I? Well, I see no significance whatsoever of making a jump up in the air. I made great leaps forward, not little jumps in studios. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to bet, because where I work, Everybody betted whether you should make a jump or not. And Certainly I, not. And I was almost the only one who said that you will never do it. I shouldn't dream it. I think it's a silly thing to ask. Yes. I think it's a puerile thing to ask, yes. And Gorbachev did it. Well, you amaze me. Yes. I wonder what he thought to the politics of a free society, if that's what they ask you to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people find it, you know, just amusing. It's just. It's just a way of showing another side of people, you know, because the people I interview are so used to talking and talking. But when I, I wasn't used to talking, I was used to doing more than little jumps. Okay, but it's hard for you to show what you do in an interview, but you can stand up and you can make like a little jump. It just, you know, it just What's shows another it? side. It just shows another side of human being, you know, because everybody jumps in their I'll own tell way. you what it shows. It shows that you want to be thought to be normal or popular. I don't have to say that or approve it. This has been my whole life. No, it's, it's just a gimmick, you know. I mean, people know that. Oh, right. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 to coin a phrase. <laughs> I do not wish to lose the respect of people whom I've kept, whose respect I've kept for years by doing something so absurd. Right? Thank you.